So as we said, this is putting your gardens to bed. And um, in this presentation, um, we're gonna cover uh, finishing uh, annuals and vegetables, uh, prepping your perennial gardens. Uh, we'll focus a little bit on non-hardy plants that you might have in your garden and planting bulbs. And we'll also get to uh, prepping your, your trees and your shrubs and your evergreens because we do have winter challenges both from weather and wildlife. And then one little slide on tending to, to um, tools and supplies at the end. So let's start out with uh, finishing off your vegetable garden and this could also apply to other annuals. So one of the ways to think about putting your garden to bed is, is thinking about making an investment in next year. Think about the spring and what you want things to be like when you start out your garden next year. Uh, so we want to clear out plants, we want to remove weeds, we want to either till or uh, add compost or plant a cover crop. Uh, and it is a great time to do a soil test and it's a great time to add soil amendments because many amendments take time uh, to do their work. So uh, as you're maybe finding out, harvesting vegetables is not a once and done thing. Um, my tomato plants always start to die back from blight and um, my cabbages come ripe and I cut them. And so you may already be removing things from uh, your vegetable garden as they finish up. Um, maybe you've planted some things recently. I've got a spot I want to put in some spinach seed. I put in green beans after the peas. So when we think of putting the garden to bed, it might not be just a once and done thing. It might be a process. One thing to notice is that if you are noticing that any of your plant material is diseased, um, then you should be removing that material from the garden and not composting it. Uh, I've got a separate trash bag in my garage right now for those um, tomato vines that have better virusy. I did get some uh, wilt in my cucumbers this year, sadly. Uh, and so I'm trying to keep that stuff out of the compost. Um, you see the little thermometer on uh, the screen there. Most home compost does not get hot enough to kill the kinds of disease organisms that could reinfect your garden when you put that compost back on. Um, if you uh, learn enough about compost and are proficient enough with it, I know some people that use the thermometer and are really scientific about it and can get the, the temperature up. But for the most part, I just have um, two compost streams, um, one from the kitchen garden, one from the garden garden, and then anything that is suspicious um, goes in the trash. So the other thing we want to be doing as fall approaches is to keep an eye on the forecast because some of our plants, particularly our vegetable plants, will tolerate a little bit of frost and some will tolerate quite a bit of frost. And it's good to know which are which and um, what precautions to take. Uh, so uh, harvest as much as you can as um, uh, the time gets closer. I believe our average first frost date is at the end of September, but we always have surprises. And one of the facts about uh, climate change is an increase in the variability of our weather. So we're more um, likely to get those surprise late frosts and early frosts. I was surprised this spring because I was taking Memorial Day as my average last day of frost, but Memorial Day was on the 23rd and we got a frost on the 30th. So I think I've uh, learned my lesson there. Um, so a light frost is when temperatures get down to uh, less than 33 degrees, but still above 28 degrees Fahrenheit. It's typically only for a few hours. And if you're new to gardening or if you're new to this area, one of the things you want to really be attending to this year is how does what happens in your yard vary from what the weather forecast is. Are you in a frost pocket? Is it a little bit warmer than usual? And I often find that um, even though we're reading the temperature from out at the airport in Keene, our Keene backyard sometimes is, is colder than that. So if you have carrots, peas, cauliflower, celery, lettuce, and beets in, they can tolerate that light frost and some other things, particularly our uh, coal family and spinach and turnips um, can handle uh, a, a heavier frost, a hard frost. 
So one of the things you want to be prepared to do, and you may want to get the material together over the next few weeks, is to think about some kind of covering for your um, tender annuals uh, and for um, those that can tolerate a light frost. And this should um, include some type of cover. It could be a plastic sheet. It could be uh, netting or fabric, just a bed sheet. Um, and also some type of uh, stakes or framework to keep uh, the plastic or the covering from actually touching the plants. So I've got a couple of sections of four by four fencing, like four by eight, and I can kind of make an arch in my raised bed and, uh, and hold a lot of stuff over that. So I tend to move that um, material into the bed where I wanna have my maybe fall greens growing. If you have tomato cages, they can hold up um, this covering too. So it's, it's a, a very, very kind of intensive uh, period when the weather's starting to get cold. You've gotta watch the weather. You've gotta be ready to run out um, before dinner maybe <laughs> and cover things up. And then um, in the morning, um, hopefully if you're working at home, you don't have to worry about whether to take it off before you jump in the car to commute, but um, you wanna uh, unwrap things and, and let that warm up again. So, um, you know, a couple of you raised this question about whether to till um, or not to till. And um, it's, it's a great question. I think for many years, we kind of felt like um, the thing to do is to get everything out of the garden, clean out all the plant debris. Often we'd add manure in the fall and we till it in and we pretty much leave the soil um, there. Um, today we have more of a focus on regenerative agriculture, on building the soil and getting um, the soil to retain uh, carbon. Um, things that improve soil health include keeping the soil covered and reducing the amount of soil disturbance these things maintain good, good water infiltration through maintaining good soil structure. Um, and they also help us to avoid compacting the soil by going out and walking back and forth over it uh, in the fall. So gently telling the surface of the soil might be right for you, depending on the size of your garden, if it's flat or raised, um, on the um, kind of equipment you have, and, and what you're prepared to do uh, in the spring. But whether you till or go no-till, um, remember that bare soil erodes and loses nutrients. So any material that provides cover for insect pests, you can think of as also providing cover for the enemies of those insect pests. Uh, and when, you're, when you put your garden to bed, it's a, it's a good thing to cover up. Let's see if I can get this to having trouble advancing. There we go. So think about fall as a time to feed the soil. Um, add a layer of compost or shredded leaves and grass. Uh, plant a cover crop. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. And if you're adding manure or lime or other amendments, particularly rock amendments uh, uh, directly to the garden, fall's a good time to do it. Um, any of these amendments uh, take a, a long time to become incorporated in the soil, uh, unlike chemical fertilizers, which are pretty quick. Um, and the winter is pretty cold, and so the kinds of processes, particularly the biological processes that break down compost and manure, aren't happening very quickly over the winter. Earthworms do a lot of this work of incorporation for us, so you can think of them as being your little mini rototillers that are going to incorporate that mulch into your garden. Uh, you can see from this slide of um, my raised beds that uh, I had mulched this bed over the winter and pulled the mulch back to put the peas in and then I was able to pull it forward again after they had sprouted and fill in. So it really saved me time to have the mulch already on the bed. However, I've noticed if I have two or three inches of leaf mulch on the beds, the soil's very, very slow to thaw out in the spring. And so this year, what I did was to pull the mulch back um, and pile it back up over by my compost heap in March to let the ground warm up so I could get those peas in nice and early and then uh, bring it back over. So what about cover crops? 
Um, last year was the first year I started to put in uh, cover crops in my raised bed. It always seemed to me like something you would do um, in a field. Um, and I'm beginning to realize the benefits of them. Um, cover crop is a way, uh, a really inexpensive way to bring uh, more fertility to your soil. Um, many cover crops will winter kill in New Hampshire so you can get them planted and growing then they die back, but over the winter, um, they hold soil in place and their root masses help keep the soil aerated. Uh, if you have a cover crop there, then they're competing with weeds that might come in in the fall. Um, they add organic matter and as they die back, that organic matter turns into a, a kind of a ready mulch for you. So there are a couple of strategies for cover crops. One is this winter kill strategy where you choose uh, seeds for plants that will die back in cold weather. They'll still provide enough biomass to cover the soil and the ground will be ready for planting in the spring. But you do have to plant them well before frost. Here's a series of two photos from another master gardener. In the top photo, she's pulled the mulch away from her tomatoes in her raised beds and she's put in uh, oat seeds pretty thickly. She's put back, uh, she's watered it in well and put back a little thin layer of mulch. And you can see in the bottom photo that a week later, she's got those oats up and her tomato plants are still growing. So that's one strategy for putting in a cover crop uh, in the next few weeks. Um, and here's um, the way that those beds look then in the spring. She had pulled the tomatoes out, the oats died back, but they have that nice layer of mulch um, ready for her to, to plant through the next year. The other type of cover crop strategy is what are called winter hardy cover crops. And these are cover crops that will survive in the winter and resume growing in the spring. So you've got to do something to get them to stop growing so you can plant what you want to plant. And that might be mowing them and kind of turning them into the soil. And you need to do that several weeks before you plant because when you turn all that good green stuff into the soil, um, it's uh, going to be um, absorbing nitrogen um, that you would want available for your plants. Uh, one recommendation is to have a mix of grasses and legumes for your cover crop because that provides a good carbon to nitrogen um, uh, ratio uh, for the material that you're, you're adding through the biomass. Um, I just ordered a very small packet, I think it was their smallest packet they had from Johnny Seeds of this fall green manure mix, and it's a blend of winter killed and winter hardy cover crops. As I said, I did this in my raised bed last year. It was growing right through the snow. Um, in, in the spring, I just kept, it was where I was gonna put my tomatoes in, so I wasn't planting really early. And I just kept pulling it up by the roots and leaving it in place. And every time it would rain, it would start to grow again. But eventually I was able to put mulch over it. And um, one of the things I noticed was as I pulled it up, there was a lot of this sort of white stringy stuff, the mycelium that comes from uh, you know, fungus that are growing around the roots that uh, plants really love. It's the stuff that helps connect the plants in your garden uh, to the nutrients in your soil. So speaking of soil, it's a great time to do a soil test. Um, it doesn't take very long to do. It's just one of those to put on maybe your Saturday morning to-do list. Um, it takes a little while because you have to collect the soil sample and you have to, to dry it. Um, but, uh, you know, getting that all set up and sent in is, is uh, really worthwhile. And um, I was uh, kind of frustrated all summer because we kept telling people to test their soil, but we kept telling them they can't do it through the UNH testing lab. So in with the handouts for today is um, a form. You can also go to just Google UNH extension soil test form, and you'll find a variety of test forms there. The one you have is the home and garden. Uh, you could do a test from your uh, lawn, you could do a test from your raised beds, you could do a test from your community garden. Uh, for garden soil, uh, you want to locate six or eight different places around your garden and then dig down six inches. So you're getting down below any surface compost, mulch, or 
uh, fertilizer that you've put on. Um, get a little sample from each of those areas uh, and mix them all together. Um, then you want to pick through and pick out any stones or debris and let it air dry. I just kind of laid it out in a dish pan in um, my basement for a little while. And then label your Ziploc bag. If you're, if you're sending in more than one sample, you might want to say garden soil, lawn, um, area under shrubs, whatever, um, just so that uh, you can put what's on the bag on your form as a separate label for your soil. Uh, so the address for extension is right on the form. Um, if you're like me, you need to remember to copy that address down and put it on the envelope <laughs> and then put the form and your, your check, it's $20 per sample, into either a padded envelope or a small box and, uh, and send it off. So what do you get for that? Um, you should get, um, all right, come on, let's advance that slide. You should get a report back uh, from extension that uh, shows uh, not only what they found in your soil, but giving recommendations for what to add. Um, and they'll have both conventional fertilizer recommendations and organic fertilizer recommendations. And this is to bring your basic soil nutrients up to not only good levels, but a good balance uh, with each other. Um, people at Extension, I'm finding, are very friendly. They're very eager to, to talk and share information. And so you can always uh, follow up with them um, or look for their handouts at UNH Extension on fertilizing if you have more questions. So um, any, any questions right now? Um, you can just sort of raise your, raise your real hand if you want to. Um, <laughs> hi, Allison, welcome. Um, you can put something in chat if you have a question. Um, Gail, I can't see everybody because I've got my screen sharing up, but if you see anybody, um, Sue, it looks like you have a question. Wanna unmute and share that with us? Yeah. So Joy, um, we always compost with straw and um, I've heard different things and we use the same straw uh, um, over a few seasons because it doesn't come, you know, it doesn't degrade. It doesn't break down. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, um, I've heard a few things about uh, whether straw will, um, will kind of incubate insects and, and whether that uh, becomes a problem uh, the following year. Um, do, do you know anything about that? So do you leave the straw in the garden year to year to year as mulch? We do. Mm -hmm. we do. And I'm wondering yeah. maybe that's not a good idea or whether yeah. we should um, try to well, dry it out. Could, yeah, one thing you could do is if you're pulling all the plants out of the garden is just turn it over and expose um, different parts of that straw bedding to um, other insects and to birds and things that might come through. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this year I really didn't have very good mulch um, on my cucumber plants. And as I said, this was the first year I had um, a, a wilt and the wilt comes from cucumber beetles. And so as I was reading about how to stop that, it said, you should have a thick layer of mulch <laughs> and that really helps. So I think there are real benefits to having um, a, a thick layer of mulch. Yes, it may um, uh, help provide cover for insect pests, but it can also provide a home for the beneficials that, that feed on those. Uh, so um, yeah, if, if I were you, I, 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 I would, um, value the benefits of the mulch and then um, maybe we can do a little troubleshooting about what the specific insect pests are and um, mm. and and uh, and how to deal with those um, the other thing would be to take the straw off and um, put it in your compost heap and then um, maybe bring in some leaf and grass mulch or something and uh, mm. that's um, not been in the garden um, I, I always um, uh, beg my husband to bag the um, <laughs> bag the mowed grass along with the mowed leaves in the fall because I think it just makes the best uh, cover um, and the best input to um, 
uh, my compost heap uh, in the fall. It's like a nice balance of green and brown material. And this spring when my neighbor um, belatedly had his leaves picked up uh, by somebody with a big mower and had all that stuff dumped out behind his house, I came over and took wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow away to uh, use in my various gardens. So yeah, yeah I'll do more cool. research on that. Good question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, anybody else? All right, I don't see anything. I'm gonna um, minimize faces and we'll just uh, head on to the, the next section. Um, but again, if you have a question, put it in the chat and we'll get to it. So let's think about prepping um, perennials. So one of the questions that came up was whether or not to cut back. Um, and sometimes we can think about propagating um, and certainly getting ahead of weeds uh, for next year. Um, so let's think about um, whether or not to, to cut back. Um, I'm drawing all these recommendations uh, from a wonderful blog post by Emma Erler, who's our um, UNH education coordinator, and she's usually on TV on Channel 9, I think on weekend mornings, and, um, and she and other UNH extension staff have been on Facebook live regularly doing lots of programs um, this, this summer because the live programs, the face-to-face -face programs were not available. So one reason not to cut some perennials back is that uh, there are flowers like purple cone flowers or black-eyed Susans and other ones listed here where the seed heads provide good food for wildlife. So if you're interested in um, attracting more wildlife uh, to your garden, and who doesn't love to see a goldfinch um, out the window on a gray day, um, then uh, you might want to think about leaving uh, some of those stalks up until spring. Another reason to do it is uh, just for your own aesthetic benefit that um, some of those dried stalks can provide some winter interest. They just look beautiful covered with snow or in the case of Christmas fern, they maintain some greenery throughout the cold weather. Um, the seed pods of uh, some of these plants just, just look nice uh, poking up. There's, um, you know, there's one aesthetic of having everything cleared out and down to the ground and and, and bear, um, but, but you know, there's also the more um, maybe woodsy <laughs> uh, natural aesthetic of having uh, some graceful uh, branches in the garden through the winter. Um, and another reason is for some of the plants, particularly ones that are not quite as, as hardy, that might not always come back as robust as we like, having those leaves and stalks poking up uh, actually allow some leaves to congregate and some snow to congregate and just helps provide a little blanket uh, over those plants throughout the winter. Um, another thing is it's a little bit easier to remember where they are um, when, uh, when spring comes and if these are sort of late rising perennials, um, I, I may be the only one here, but I doubt it who has accidentally weeded <laughs> Like, oh, that's right, that's where I planted bus and such, and I forgot all about it. Uh, so sometimes they help provide a clue to what's there. So when we, when we do cut back, um, we want to think about, um, again, if there is any diseased foliage to put that into a separate stream. Uh, again, we have a very small property, so there isn't like a back 40 where I can take it and put it away from the garden. It, it goes into uh, the one trash bag that we almost fill every month um, and, um, and goes off somewhere else. Um, but otherwise we want to compost the dead foliage. Um, I did get little wooden tags this year so maybe I'm going to mark some locations of things. But if you have iris or daylilies or hosta, stilbees, peonies, yarrow, all this stuff, blocks, um, you can just cut that uh, right to the ground in the winter and, and compost the vegetative parts. Um, some foliage will main, uh, well, well, some perennials will, will hold on to their foliage later. Uh, and so you, uh, again, this is one of those things where like your vegetable garden, it's a little bit of a process. Things that die back earlier can be cut back earlier and things that die back later, um, maybe you'll have your winter coat on before you're cutting them back. Um, if there is basal foliage around the stems, it's a good idea to leave um, that alone, just cut back the stalks and the stuff that really sticks up above the ground. 
Um, what about propagating? Um, uh, you know, an, another confession I have is that I tend to divide my perennials whenever I feel like <laughs> dividing my perennials <laughs> according to uh, the time, inspiration, and oh, this would look good there. Um, but you know, the recommended time is, is to divide and move them in spring. However, I have some four o'clocks that are, you know, like mint, a plant that likes to take over and I'm, I'm waiting until maybe another week or so to move them out of the perennial bed where um, they were taking up a lot of space in a brand new bed that didn't have a lot in it. And now it's time for them to go out and be put on the edges of the woods where they can do what they want and get mowed when they get out of place. Uh, I also have a lot of um, sort of self-seeding uh, perennials. I guess they're really annuals um, and annuals that I plant in my garden. So this is another time where I'm going around and um, picking off those seed heads and either saving them to plant in the spring or just sort of scattering them around the garden. I've decided that dill uh, doesn't really belong in my raised beds. It belongs in my perennial beds. So every time I get a dill volunteer in my uh, raised bed, I let the seed uh, seeds develop and then I uh, cut that off and put it in the back of the perennial bed where it can come up next year. So getting ahead of weeds, um, again you want to think about how do you want this garden to look in the spring and uh, often plants that are weeds are weeds because they're uh, so good at growing late into the season and starting early in the season and they tend to get ahead of the plants that we really want to see more of. And so one way, if you have the time, is to uh, dedicate a day or so to, to doing some weeding or while you're doing, you're cutting back and you can see the ground again um, to do some weeding. Instead of using landscape fabric, um, this has been a very good year for cardboard. A lot of people have been getting stuff shipped to their houses. If you break down those boxes and wet them and put them on the ground uh, around your plants, or a thick layer of wet newspaper or both, and then put your, wet, uh, your wood mulch um, over it, you can get a really good barrier that's also gonna eventually degrade and, and go into the soil. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a low, uh, low investment monetarily gardener, uh, and so um, my, my cardboard's been free. I've scavenged newspaper from my neighbors who get a newspaper subscription. And I go to the transfer station to get free wood chips. Uh, whenever I take my recycling there, I just fill the recycling bins with wood chips and bring them home and do a little bit of a project. So I'm making a shade garden right now on the west side of the house under a big oak tree. And uh, this was my project last weekend was to um, put some, some cardboard and some newspaper and some wood mulch around my new uh, Dicentro. So questions, any questions about um, um, perennials uh, or cutting them back or leaving them in? Any hands up, Gail? Yes. Any, um, uh, anything in the chat? Jean, Jean has a question. I have a question about hellebore since it comes out early in the spring. Mm, mm -hmm. um, what's a good way to protect it from how cold it gets here? Mm, yeah, good, good question. Does anybody else on the um, on the call grow hellebore? It's also called Lenten rose. Right, right. My sister grows it in North Carolina, and she always sends me these pictures in February, which of course make me very jealous. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I I don't have I, any experience with it. Anybody else chime in? I have several hellebores. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't do anything to them. I'm a little bit warmer than Keen, I think, because I'm in Greenfield. Um, and I just let them be green all winter. And in the spring, when they send up their new shoots with the flowers, then I cut back the uh, old green that had from the previous year. But I don't cut it back until, oh, I don't know, probably the end of March. Okay. All right, great. So that's Thank an you. example of, of letting the vegetation hang on a little bit to provide a little, um, maybe a little trapping of heat and, uh, and leaves and, and snow over the winter. Well, it also adds some winter interest to the garden because it's yeah. green all the time. Um, yeah. 
All right, I'm putting it on my list. <laughs> I want some, some hellebore. Some of the flowers are, are beautiful. Mine, because I don't have enough sun, uh, they turn their heads down towards the ground. Mm -hmm. White and pale green and a, a green and sort of a plum and a plum color. And the, the center of the flower is a like a lime green or something. But they're very can you spell that halibor, did you say? H-E-L-E-B-O-R-E. -E. Thank you. Yeah. It's here on uh, this slide under things that have um, evergreen foliage. I hope I spelled oh. it right. <laughs> um, yeah, it is lovely. Yeah, Joy, there's a question in the chat though. It said, um, uh, they have pumpkin plants that were doing great, but the center is wilted and the soil is mostly cow manure. And why might they have wilted in the center? It, so did the greens wilt in the center or the pumpkins? Well, um, I think it's the greens. The greens, yes, mm -hmm. but not the ends of the greens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I I am a, I have sort of a black thumb with squash. I keep trying, um, but um, there there are two things that tend to go after uh, most um, uh, winter squash and in, including pumpkins. One is a squash vine borer, and um, now I've learned uh, the signs <laughs> of when a borer is active. So uh, it's a um, a flying insect that lays eggs in the vine and then maggots uh, kind of eat out um, the inside of the vine. So um, as I grow my squash, I'm very attentive to what's going on. And when I uh, see those signs, sometimes you see some little extrusions from the vine. I actually sliced open the stem and pulled out the maggots and wrapped the stem with um, a, a little bit of string and buried it under soil and kept it wet for, um, you know, uh, every day for about a week. In one case, I just put a rock over it so it wouldn't get exposed to the air. And and that vine, both those vines survived when I did that. Wow. Um, squash bugs tend to uh, really decimate these. And um, uh, that's something where you can uh, Google squash bug. I'll, I'll uh, make a note to add um, a handout on that if they have one from um, UNH. But they have very distinctive uh, eggs that look like little copper beads on the back of the squash leaves. So I'm always checking the backs of my squash leaves and scraping them off. And right now squash bugs are running to my squash from uh, my neighbor's squashes <laughs> at the community garden. And so I'm on um, uh, you know, bug squishing patrol there. Um, there are also various wilts. So uh, the Hubbard squash really got attacked by the squash bugs and the squash vine borers in my garden. Right next to them was planted spaghetti squash, which just did not have a bug problem. That tells me something. Stop planting Hubbard squash. Um, but the, um, the uh, spaghetti squash has really gotten that uh, powdery mildew. It's gotten mildew on its leaves and the leaves have died back from the ground first. Um, and are still going strong up at the top. And so that's one of the things that even though I'm getting good squash, the plants themselves are dying back. Um, so if you want, you all, um, I'll send out with the other handout, the um, uh, contact for the info line. If you wanna send a picture in of what's happening uh, to your pumpkins, uh, to the um, UNH extension info line, uh, they can email with you or talk to you on the phone about the problem, but it's great oh. if you can have a good photograph and if you can describe both the healthy parts and the affected parts of the plant and talk a little bit about when you saw that um, problem developing. And, uh, and they can sort of help diagnose it for you and give you some uh, tips on uh, what to do to um, keep it from happening again next year. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's um, let's move ahead. Um, time is really moving along. <laughs>
So um, sometimes you want to bring some of your potted plants um, indoors for the winter. Just make sure to check and make sure you don't have insects uh, in there um, or any disease. Again, kind of clean them up. You might want to repot them um, and trim out any uh, damaged uh, pots or parts of your plants. Um, uh, we also have um, some tender perennials um, uh, in my flower boxes and in my hanging baskets. Some people plant them right in the beds uh, that you might want to try to keep going and replant again next year. Um, in some cases, like with coleus or geraniums, um, you can take uh, cuttings and root them and keep small plants going throughout the winter. Don't try to get them to, to bloom, but just sort of keep them healthy. And then you can plant them out again um, in uh, the following year. Um, other plants um, require a winter rest period or dormancy. So in the case of um, maybe things like uh, lantana um, or fuchsia, you um, aren't really gonna have them blooming in your house, but if you bring them in, cut them back, um, and put them in a, a, a sort of partially lit place where it doesn't get below 50, but not too much above 50. Uh, you can keep them going over the winter. So uh, I've got a great lantana right now. The um, uh, hummingbirds are on it every day. I yeah. you know, wish it would bloom inside like that all winter. Yeah. Um, but what I'm reading is that um, right now I should start to cut back on fertilizing it, um, not overwater it. And then maybe I'll put it in a basement windowsill for the winter. And you know, if it makes it through, I'll have it to repot and put out again um, next year. Um, some people uh, plant tubers and um, uh, and fall plants in their garden. Um, this is a picture of something yeah. called elephant ears that a friend of mine grows. Um, many people plant gladiolas and dahlias and um, tubers, begonias, and canna lilies. And so these um, bulbs need to be taken out of the ground uh, in the winter um, and overwintered and then replanted again. So uh, for example, if you were gonna do that with the elephant ears, you would wait until after the first frost, cut back the dead foliage and have this little form or stump with the roots attached and then um, dig around it about three inches out um, from uh, the, the stem and pull it up and rinse off the roots to try to get most of the dirt out of it. And then you wanna bring it indoors and let it dry pretty thoroughly uh, and pack it in peat moss or, or peat moss or vermiculite to uh, kind of keep it covered up throughout the winter. But keep checking it. If you have a bunch of these and some get moldy, you'll wanna pull them out so they don't um, spread that uh, for the, um, to the next, um, uh, corn in the pot. And it's uh, time to think about uh, fall bowl planting as well. Um, right now the Cheshire County Conservation District has a summer bulb sale going on um, at right now through September 8th. So if you uh, put CCCD into your Google or um, if you um, are on their email list, you've gotten an order form, and I'm sure many of the garden stores have bulbs for sale. So um, depending on where you are, late September and October through um, uh, um, early November are good times to plant bulbs up here. You don't wanna plant too early. You want the soil temperature to be below 60, but um, if you felt the temperatures last night, I think it was supposed to get down to 49 degrees um, in, in August, we're already starting to get a little bit of cooling. So mm. be thinking about where those bulbs would go and what you'd wanna plant. Um, considerations are to um, keep in mind, you're gonna have to do some digging that uh, the, the depth of a bulb is really dependent in part on the size of the plant. And that's you know, somewhat related to the size of the bulb. So, um, you want to be able to um, either use a bulb planter or a spade to, to dig down deep. Um, you want to think about how to mix um, a variety of bulbs or cluster those bulbs together uh, and think about what kind of amendments to put in the soil to uh, feed the green parts of those um, plants. Um, and um, 
when you start to put things like bone meal into the ground, you'll find that not only the bulbs, but the smell of the bone meal itself uh, attract critters who like to eat those bulbs. So um, depending on your experience with this or what you're expecting, um, you might want to put your bulbs in cages where the, uh, the vegetation can grow through, but the critters can't get in to, to eat the bulbs. So um, any, any questions on uh, that part of the talk? Um, Drew, there's another question in the champ, I mean, the champ, sorry, in the chat about a rain vegetable bed. Uh, what do you recommend um, for winter killing plant? For a winter killing plant? For planting, winter killing planting. Yeah. Oops. Peas. Can you put, can you put the peas out in the, uh, the end of the year for the, that will be there? I think you can do that, right? I can plant my peas like at the end. So they're all out there all winter long and they just come up in the spring. No, they don't. They die. Okay, so we have a question about whether to plant peas now to come up in the spring. Is that the question? Well, well also that somebody wanted to know what the you, um, uh, should plant in a raised bed for a winter killer. Oh, for for a winter kill cover crop. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll send out um, a handout on that. Um, so uh, there's a, um, a nice list available. Uh, you can go to, um, uh, I'll, I'll put the site from Johnny Seeds has a very informative um, site. Um, I got the link from Rachel Bryce who um, was on a, a talk with me earlier. And so it's got a list of the things that you can use for um, winter kill and the things that you can use for uh, winter hardy. Uh, and as and, I said, and, yeah, it's nice to get a mix sometimes too. And you, you use that, and you use winter hardy in a rate's bed, right? Is that what last you said? Year I, yeah, last year I think I had winter rye and vetch mixed together. And that was winter hardy. So winter hardy cover crops include winter rye, winter wheat, hairy vetch, Austrian winter peas, and crimson clover. Yeah, I put um, a cover crop down last year for the first time too, because we were giving them out here. And I think for me, the deciding factor was I waited too long, so I didn't have a choice anymore. And uh, I think I would like by the winter kill one because it was a little challenging for me to keep up with all the weeding in the spring in a yeah, rage bed yeah. in the ra yeah. actually that made it a little harder in the rage bed yeah yeah so i used the seed from the library last year too so i had the the winter hardy one winter killed cover crops you can use the oats a field, something called field peas oilseed radish and rapeseed so those are the most common ones that you'll see for, for this area. All right, so let's just talk quickly about um, getting our trees and shrubs ready. Um, this is not the time to do pruning unless you have either dead branches, uh, damaged or broken branches. Um, and then it's a good time to look for any signs of pests or, or disease. Um, this is magnolia scale and it tends to be um, at a kind of active and vulnerable time uh, right now um, for, um, you know, it's a good time to intervene in, the, in its life cycle, shall we say. And then of course, we're in New England, breaking leaves <laughs> is gonna be one of your tasks. Um, if you have space, as I said, you want to make your own leaf mold. Um, I love mowing and bagging uh, leaves and grass together at the end of the season. Um, I layer it in sometimes with a compost with my neighbor's mm -hmm. chicken manure and um, the stuff that's coming out of my gardens. Or you can put it right on your raised beds or on your garden. Remember to keep watering. It's been very dry this summer in general and dry right now. And our shrubs need, um, particularly if they're new and our trees are new, they need a good two inches a week. Um, it's important to water deeply before the ground freezes, especially for evergreens, because evergreens continue to transpire even in cold weather. 
and to lose water to the wind um, blowing over their leaves. And so making sure that they get a good uh, long drink uh, throughout September and October, it's really important. It's one of the things that we tend to kind of tail off on as the weather gets cooler because um, we're not thirsty. <laughs> um, and then mulch plants to conserve that water in the soil. Um, think about what might want to nibble on the tender young bark of your trees or shrubs over the winter. Um, particularly when we have snow cover, those critters come above the ground, but below the snow line, rabbits and mm -hmm. holes, and can nibble on that. So if you've had some damage or you have some new things that you've invested in um, or you're anticipating this, just take a little hardware cloth and, uh, and make a, a, a cylinder uh, around the bark or around the whole base of the shrub and bury it a little bit below the soil so they're not just coming in under it and having a nice protected place to snack on your, your shrubs. Um, we get winter damage from salt, um, but also from drying or desiccation. Uh, and some of the plants that are prone to winter in injury are um, some of our favorites, uh, like Japanese maple and roses. Last year was just a devastating year for rhododendrons. You may have seen a lot of rhododendrons and junipers and arborvites that were just brown over most of them. Um, this past winter, and it was that combination of cold temperatures and wind um, and, and lack of water. Uh, so again, you can um, water them well, and then uh, if they're in exposed areas to protect them, you can wrap them directly. Um, the bark, uh, particularly thin bark, is subject to sun scald, where you get sun directly on the bark, but the temperatures are freezing and it splits, so you can get wraps for those. Um, you can make a barrier with burlap and stakes or with chicken wire and just sort of fill it, fill it in with leaves. The important thing is to keep the plant protected from wind, um, from changes in like very strong sun in cold temperatures uh, and changes in temperature. So you, you don't want to do something like covering a plant with leaves until it's already very cold and pretty continuously cold outside. Uh, and then snuggle it up. Um, some cane plants can be bound up um, and, uh, and then covered. Um, and as I said, if you're interested in roses, there's a handout for that. I don't grow roses, so there's not much I can tell you, um, but it's, uh, it's a great handout. Um, and finally, don't forget to put away all, all your pots and all your tools. And um, it's uh, great to just, um, you know, take a day to empty things out and bring them in. Uh, I invested in isopropyl alcohol last year to clean my tools, and I was glad I had it in my hand because that was my hand sanitizer um, <laughs> when, when things got very interesting this spring. Um, but, you know, clean everything. Remember that, you know, plant diseases are transferred by tools, so using that 70% isopropyl alcohol or making a bleach solution and soaking things that can be soaked in bleach solution for 20 minutes. Um, and this includes your pots, particularly if you're gonna reuse your, um, your plastic pots. And last of all, sharpen your cutting tools. I don't know anything about sharpening, um, but it's kind of on my list of things that would be good to know how to do. Um, so as I said, if you wanna know more, there are great resources at um, Ask UNH Extension. And if you're on Facebook, uh, search for Ask UNH Extension. They're putting on two programs a week, and I think they probably have links to tapes of those um, programs. Most of them are 15 to 20 minutes. You can send in questions, and it's just been a, a, a great resource to have um, this, uh, this year particularly. I, I encourage you all to, um, you know, to reach out to your local master gardeners, um, to reach out to UNH Extension, the conservation district here is just wonderful too. And just keep gardening and keep sharing information.